C.W. Goodyear was born in Louisiana, and he moved between Australia and the UK while growing up before returning to the U.S. to attend Yale University. He graduated in 2016 with a degree in global affairs, then moved to Washington, D.C. Goodyear's first book project was a collaboration with formal naval officer Chris Fassell. He subsequently worked on in Washington as a ghostwriter before beginning his work on the life of President Garfield, and he currently lives in Alexandria, Virginia. Of course, the book we are here for this evening is titled President Garfield from Radical to Unifier. It is the first comprehensive biography in decades of America's 20th president. And I've got to read just one piece of praise here from Pulitzer Prize winning author James McPherson, who writes, quote, Mr. Goodyear has given us an eloquent and moving biography of our 20th president. Born and raised in rural poverty, Garfield raised himself up by his bootstraps, fought as a general in the Civil War, rose to leadership in post-war Congresses, and suffered martyrdom by assassination that launched the beginnings of the end of the system that killed him. Goodyear's lucid prose disentangles the complexities and ambiguities of this story, end quote. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming C.W. Goodyear and Jeffrey L. Nichols to the stage. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. Um, when uh, Alex asked me to be a part of this, I jumped right on it, obviously being able to talk about some 19th century stories. I didn't realize we'd be in 19th century, uh, but I think it adds to the flavor of the event. So, uh, so um, it's really an honor to be here with, uh, with Charlie, uh, and uh, I've had the pleasure of reading the book and uh, watching several of the videos you've put out for this, and so it's been a, been a great experience learning about someone who like many of you may, I did not know a great deal about. So without further ado, um, why did you write this book on James Garfield? Uh, yeah, it? no, fantastic. That's the question that biographers of Roosevelt and Wilson and Lincoln never had to answer, but I've had to answer maybe, um, maybe over a thousand times, I think, since I started this five years ago. Uh, I, I found him indirectly. I, I was working in DC as a ghostwriter five years ago, and I was working... Uh, I was writing with and for more important people. And I think as a product of where I was geographically at the time, and then where we are geopolitically, where we were geopolitically then and where we still are today, I was very interested in finding a period of our nation's history where the conditions of division were overrunning the country. And somebody of that time on the national stage was trying to lead the nation in a way that was defying the division of those times. So I was drawn to reconstruction in the Gilded Age. So those delightfully vague parts of American history that followed the much you know, more dramatic civil war. And throughout that time, throughout those, th throughout those almost two decades of history, uh, I, I found the same person lurking in the background of most every single, ma single uh, major political event of those eras. And um, so that was remarkable enough, but more interestingly to me, uh, it was somebody who everybody of that time, regardless of their own politics, uh, was saying vaguely nice things about. And that struck me as even stranger. And that person was James Garfield. And whenever he appeared in the historical record throughout the span of our history, he would, his, his record would be distilled into a single line. And it would be James Garfield, future president, would be assassinated within his first year of office. But the deeper I dug into his life story, uh, the more convinced I was that that was incredibly unfair. Even before his election to the presidency, Garfield was being described as one of the most influential and accomplished Americans of all time. And the span of his, I'm not, I'm, I'll, I'll let, I'll tease this out a little bit, but uh, the span of his career just struck me as incredible and borderline, incredible in a literal sense. And I did not believe it with all the things that he accomplished. But uh, I was just drawn in. I was hooked. Uh, and so that, that, that's where this story began. And in many ways, that's where my life began, because he was just such a compelling subject. Just playing off of that, why do you think he sort of faded from the historical narrative? That's a good question. So I think it, it, the effect of his assassination was dramatic. And I, the, the analogy I've used is it was like setting off a firework at the end of a Broadway play. No one remembers the play. They all remember the firework. <laughs> the, 
this the spectacular nature of his demise and the uh, almost heroic martyrdom esque nature of it, just kind of the the drama of that all uh, obscured many people's memory of the life that came beforehand and the way our historical memory works as a nation as it re as it re as it relates to presidents at least our executive leaders we ask ourselves implicitly how long was this person in the white house for and what did they accomplish while in it and for garfield that's a very short story through no fault of his own but the bigger narrative is very impressive he was the last president to be born in a log cabin he was born in 1831 in the western reserve of ohio so actually not terribly far from here uh, raised by a single mother. His dad died when he was two, and he would never remember his dad. He never knew his dad. He wasn't even the first James Garfield of his family. He was named after an elder sibling who had died before he was born. Uh, and much would be made of his transition from the log cabin to the White House. So people focused on the beginning and the very end of his life, and that was what they made campaign hay out of. But in between, he was, by his late 20s, he was a a uh, college president, a state senator, and an abolitionist preacher all at the same time, simultaneously in his part of Ohio. Uh, you fast forward a year, and then he's the youngest brigadier general of that time in the Union Army during the Civil War. And then you fast forward another year and a half, and he is technically the second youngest congressman in the country. He would always refer to himself as the youngest because he would exclude at-large members. But technically, he was second youngest. So I, I have to make that clarification. And then he had this 17 year congressional career, which which by the standards of that time was almost a record breaker. You know, today we're spoiled for people who go to Washington and never leave. In that time of American history, that was almost unprecedented. The length of time Garfield stayed in the House gathering legislative power. Uh, he was also a practicing Supreme Court attorney while he served in Congress. Uh, he wrote, he was an excellent writer. He wrote great articles for the Atlantic. Uh, he also founded the first Federal Department of Education as a congressperson. And he also authored an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So all of those things, I would, and, and more, because I'm trying to just format, but, uh, I, you know, as a researcher and a young, younger person in DC, I felt lazy, I felt jealous, and I was intrigued. And that was, that, you know, so I got deeper into this remarkable subject. You felt lazy with this large book that you produced. Yeah, no, I did. And, and I did. And what was especially lazy to me was my manuscript was longer. It was like 200 pages longer. And everybody who's written knows that it's much easier to write a long thing than it is to write a short thing. And so I got into a, not a fight, but a long discussion with my publisher about what to trim and where to trim. And so, you know, we lost about 200 pages along the way. But one thing they did right from the get go that they just knocked out of the park was the cover. Um, they, you know, there, there are a few decisions during the editorial process where the publisher just has veto power and they just tell you what's going to happen. And they say, we found the perfect cover for this. It's something that accentuates his eyes. Women of the time, men of the time, always discussed Garfield's lightning blue eyes. They said they blaze like battle. I've heard a female historian describe how handsome he was. I've heard female friends of mine describe him. And th there was the phrase, this is a little embarrassing, that one of my female friends said, which is that uh, James Garfield can quote, get it, <laughs> which was funny. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so it was a it was a long fight getting this into the final format that it is. And it, but the hardest part was at the beginning in many ways, because you, you're, you're not wrong and you're totally on base to describe yourself as not really knowing anything about him when you first heard that name. Um, so it took a, lot, a while to convince people in the publisher's houses to that there's really something to this incredible story. So just remember, Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Right. So you're not even there yet, right? No, no. So you're not, doing not pretty not, well. Um, not at all. So, so I, I, thank you for, for sharing all that. And I, I like to take a small step back. You described his childhood. What was that like? And how was his education? And, and where was the education? Uh, yeah, no, it was, it was incredibly hard scrabble. He was born into the Western Reserve of Ohio, which is oxymoronically the northeastern part of Ohio. Um, it's called the Western Reserve because it was it was it was reserved for Connecticut, Connecticut colonists to settle. Right. And um, well, eventually Connecticut lost that privilege. And so but it, but it retained the name Western Reserve. And so it was then eventually added to what would become the state of Ohio. And then that's where it became. But it was this it was it, despite its geography, because it's so close, it's closer than other parts of Ohio to the eastern coast. It was the last part of Ohio to be meaningfully settled by white men because it was just geographically such a rough and difficult place. 
uh, by the turn of the century, so about 1800, you still only had a few hundred settlers distributed along the Lake Erie shoreline in that part of Ohio. And so those conditions were disappearing by the time that Garfield was born in 1831, but they weren't quite gone. And so by virtue of not only, you know, where he was born geographically, but also the great difficulties of his household. He was the youngest of a bunch of siblings. And again, the father of all these kids died when Garfield was only two. So they all had to work manual labor growing up and Garfield just absolutely hated it. Uh, he would repeatedly injure himself on the job. Uh, I'm pretty sure accidentally, he much preferred to be inside. He actually didn't mind getting injured because it would allow him to stay in bed and read with his mom looking after him. Um, and he would find that education was really what he preferred doing. Education was the catalyzing spark to his life. And it kindled this volcanic ambition within him. I don't think he ever got over how difficult the circumstances he was born into. This is the great cruelty in many ways of our election system. We ask our candidates not to monetize, but to capitalize on their hardships in life. And so whenever Garfield was on the campaign trail in life, especially from a young age, many people would make really rich campaign material out of everything he did as a kid and what he eventually ended up accomplishing. They would describe him as the encapsulation of the American dream. And Garfield would go along with this, but he would also bristle internally. He was a Again, you know, this young wartime general in Washington, D.C., and as happens in Washington, if any of y'all have been, they're always networking. And so he was coming up against younger people who were clerks and aides to senators and congressmen, and they would meet him, who's their age, and they would just hear his life story, and they would praise him. And, but he wrote this message home to his wife at the time, and he said, let no man praise me because I was born poor. In every way, it was bad for my life. And he would go on, and he would say verbatim, he would wonder what, it would, what more he could have accomplished if he had been allowed when he grew up to enjoy the privilege of having a father and some wealth. So regardless of what he did, and I think this is still true for a lot of people who follow that similar arc today in America, you know, when you get to the end of that compelling, you know, racks to riches story, the person who has the riches at the end, they're not asking themselves, they're not slapping themselves on the back. They're asking themselves what more they could have done if they had the privileges everybody else took for granted. And he never really got over it. I don't and think it's also sort of that we call today sort of that imposter syndrome too, where you show up there and you're you're in a different realm than when you were a child. And I think yeah, that adds to it. yeah. And he bristled at it. It was also a very progressive place. You, he was a hyper progressive American for his time, and as a part of the geography, the Western Reserve was the endpoint for a lot of routes on the Underground Railroad. It had the highest concentration by one measure of stops on the Underground Railroad as any because it was right on the Lake Erie shoreline. So slaves would flee through that part of Ohio and then they would sail to the truly free land of Canada by that time. And so that creates in the local population fervent militant abolitionism. And Garfield channeled some of that as a young man and that influenced his decision to join the Civil War. Um, but importantly, John Brown was also raised in the Western Reserve. And so you can see the connective tissue between the politics of that time and what happened. Another Connecticut boy. Actually. Another Connecticut boy, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So you, you mentioned already that he makes this turn towards abolition. Um, and is that based on, uh, as you mentioned, where he, he grew up is also based on his religion? How did, it, how did that? Yeah, those, really th those things all blended in a very interesting way. Where he was born uh, was obviously a very, very big influence in that. But the religion, too, he was a part of the Disciples of Christ movement, which is still around today in a, in a variety of formats now. But it put tremendous initiative for uh, determination of politics into the hands of its laity. The, the, the disciples of Christ didn't really believe in having a formal clergy. They had preachers instead that were formed from regular people who were attending mass like you or I. And um, that also gave a lot of the laity, a lot of the regular parishioners, um, liberty to apply the Bible's teachings to their own style of politics. They were given a lot of free reign to interpret as they would. So the movement Garfield joined was this localized form of his church that mirrored the, the politics that he had come from. But you fast forward to ahead of the Civil War, and he is arguing privately as a state senator in Ohio. It's part of the radical triumvirate of Columbus, Ohio. That's his, and he's younger than me by this point. And he's writing to his wife and his friends that the Civil War to come is actually a holy war. And it's a holy war because it's part of divine will to punish America and remind America of the importance of actually building a land of equality. And he writes home that the idea of the South actually forming a society, as he puts it, based on the monstrous injustice of human slavery, he says that will be a cane among the nations of the earth. 
So you can hear that biblical evangelical progressive engine coming to bear. And he was ready to fight. He saw, he saw in the Civil War great opportunity to make America as he thought it should be. And then also to do something for himself. He wanted a national political profile. And he thought a great way to do that would be to form uh, a regiment of volunteers and lead them to battle, valiant battle. And that ended up being exactly what he did. And again, not the only person to have that idea during the no, Civil War. But that actually does lead it up to the Civil War. He's obviously Republican at this point, free yeah. soil and all those things. And so as the war breaks out and he's in Ohio, you mentioned he begins to form a regiment. You talked about that process and what came of that in, yeah. in his career in the, in the U.S. Army. Yeah, yeah. He, um, you know, I, 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 I think he, he decided to go about this business of raising a volunteer regiment. A lot of people these days forget that in the early times of our nation's history, we didn't have a large standing peacetime army. Every time there was an existential conflict of that time, the, our, our government would turn to regular community men to form volunteer, you know, divisions, regiments. Uh, formed of, you know, people who basically are like dad's army. They just like pick up a, you know, bayonet or rifle, they do some training and they get issued equipment and then they go to war behind a local community leader. Garfield forms this regiment, the 42nd Ohio, from his parishioners, because he's preaching to these people, from these college students that he's kind of a father figure to, a father figure that he never really had. And uh, also his voters, he had a perfect you know, political, religious, educational base to build this regiment for himself. And he's, he's going out and he's rallying, he's giving these sermons that are, again, imbuing religious significance into this conflict. Um, and so, but the Civil War, it, it couldn't have gone better for him, at least in the early years. He goes south, he goes into East Kentucky, and he ends up leading this valiant campaign through this desolate landscape against a series of pretty bedraggled rebel troops and uh, by virtue of the timing of this campaign, it's the Sandy Valley campaign in East Kentucky, he wins it in early 1862, when, as you know, the Union had very little else to show for the war by that point. And so by virtue of that timing, he becomes a, kind of a military celebrity overnight. He appears on the front page of the New York Times, the Evening Star in Washington. These great columns are written about and call him. And he's swiftly promoted to being the youngest brigadier general in the Union Army. As a matter of fact, in one of the New York Times columns describing him, uh, you know, winning this remarkable campaign, a few paragraphs up, it also describes a man named Hiram Eddy returning to Connecticut after being released from uh, Libby Prison, the Confederate Libby Prison. And Hiram Eddy is actually one of my ancestors. We, we live in his house in Connecticut. My parents do, at least. So that's a nice way of this was meant to be. But, the, but, but having won that fame, Garfield then goes deeper into the South. He's, he's then seconded to all these different regiments. He's at Shiloh. And then he gets into Alabama eventually. And he starts to, he's an abolitionist in a soldier's uniform, an abolitionist politician in a soldier's uniform. And he describes in these agonizing letters home, how difficult it is to watch slaves pour out of these fields at the sight of oncoming Union troops and these Union troops then turning away the slaves back to their fields at Bayonet Point, because that's not the type of war the Union Army is fighting at that point. They're fighting to you know, restore sovereignty to the nation. They're trying to respect Southern property. So Garfield is in this terrible position. He's, he's hating the, the way the Union military structure is repressing his instincts for how this war needed to be fought, what it was really about. He's hiding slaves in camp against orders. Um, and he's writing home, he writes to his wife that we seem to be as much their enemies as their masters. And he's writing about former slaves running out of the field. And then he goes on and he writes home, I can foresee now that the larger of the two conflicts before this nation has yet to come. There will spring out of this war dozens of new questions and dangers, the settlement of which will be of more importance than finishing the war itself. And he's talking about reconstruction. He can see what's going to happen and how important winning the peace will be. Um, and then he goes on to say, I think I could do better service in settling those questions in Congress than in the army. So he's, he's dropping hints. He's saying, put me in Congress. And that's exactly what happens. He gets elected in absentia to go to Congress and he becomes this firebrand radical Republican and somebody who's ideologically in the same camp as the great Pennsylvanian Thaddeus Stevens. But he's also, you know, nearly the youngest member of the house. So he's fighting with Thaddeus Stevens a lot, the oldest member of the house. They become this, you know, conflicting duo, but it was a lot a of people thought fought with that issue. Yeah, yeah. He seemed to make a specialty out of it, which is great. But that's where his national political profile began, and he made hay of it. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, playing off of that a little bit more, there's a quote in your book about someone describing him as a wild 
a radical has ever sat in Congress. Yeah, yeah. And then he, he'll have a, we'll have a transformation, will he not over time? Oh, Can yeah, you absolutely. Because you fast forward a decade and a bit, and Garfield is suddenly, he's not the, not suddenly, this happens over just an age's worth of political crises that he has a front row seat to. And Garfield is pretty much the only radical who survives politically for that long. And by the end, you have a very different man. You don't have this young house firebrand who is as wild a radical as anybody has ever seen. You have this compromiser who is now legislatively the most experienced Republican in the house and who is determined, pathologically determined to be friendly with everybody in Washington. He's the last person who everybody likes on a personal level. Um, and he and he manages that transition on both a personal and professional level. He writes during the impeachment of Andrew Johnson when he starts seeing the political downsides of radicalism and the way the voters are changing their mind about having to worry about the South. He writes, I'm trying to do two things at the same time. I'm trying to be a radical and not a fool. He sees like political pragmatism as suddenly being terribly important as the tides change in the American electorate. He sees the progressivism he once believed in is starting to be uh, impossible to actually practice and even harmful politically for himself. And he also writes, he's starting to get very worried and very weary about the amount of partisanship and nasty political rhetoric that's suddenly becoming so common in American politics at that time. He, he's writing, um, you know, I never feel to slap a man in the face as any real gain to the truth. He becomes this great technocratic nerd of the Republican House. And he becomes obsessed with keeping the Republican Party united so that it can hold on to power in some way, shape, or form. It might not be accomplishing what it hoped to immediately after Reconstruction, but uh, Garfield is now trying to just desperately keep this loose and fraying Republican coalition together. So you fast forward to the end of Reconstruction, it's a very different man. And um, he, he, he's torn up by it. His, his reflections and his meditations on the course of the country are just fascinating because you see in him somebody who's realizing that this truly just and righteous republic that he envisioned as being necessary after the civil war he's not going to see that in his lifetime and he's trying to do what he can but the the, the battle is being lost and he starts trying to see that uh discretion is the better part of valor when it comes to american politics at that time so he he had power obviously as a member of congress too and he was a, a chair of the appropriations committee at one point is that correct yeah for a long time he loved currency uh, he, 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 had, he had this. Who doesn't? Yeah, right. He, well, yeah. he was very bad with his own, but he, he thought that fiscal policy, and he wrote this during the war, that it was going to be incredibly important to managing whatever came after the war. And he was entirely right. He saw it as being very legislatively useful as becoming this house master, this maestro of currency policy, fiscal policy. He wanted to be the person through which all of the spending of the government ran. He, he did. He succeeded in doing that by becoming chair of the House Appropriations Committee for a long time. And that was where he tried to distinguish himself. You had these great political show ponies of that time who were rising. You had men like, Patty Stevens was one, but afterwards you had James Blaine, you had Roscoe Conkling, you had all these just flamboyant, fantastic, corrupt, just caricatures of American politicians. We saw a caricature downstairs of one of them. Yeah, we did. We saw Blaine. And, um, but Garfield distinguished himself by being the person who's not worried about getting headlines. He just wants to get good, sound legislation done. He wants to become, the, again, the maestro of legislative uh, affairs and legislative policy. So he distinguished himself by doing all the work and you know, doing that, that keeping the gears of our government turning while all these other claimers to the throne are playing politics in a very disruptive and divisive way. He was involved, though, in some of the, the post-war, um, you know, basically acts, like the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and other things. He did play a role in some of that. Oh, yeah. But there's a point where he loses faith in, in Reconstruction? or He loses faith. He loses interest. He starts, he starts um, fishing about for a new form of fixing this age-old problem of basically race relations in the United States. And, he, start, and he's, he, he tries to distance himself in part because he sees it as a losing political battle. Republicans are being punished at the polls for continuing to worry about fixing the South as Reconstruction goes on. But yeah, no, he's involved in all of that. His legislative record is insane. Uh, he, 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 the, what he witnessed in that time, he, he was not only involved in all the civil rights legislation of that era, he was also involved in investigating President Grant for financial misconduct. He was the head of a committee that was in charge of doing that. Um, he was in charge of relocating a, a tribe of Native Americans from Western Montana. He 
designed the U.S. Census. He became involved very heavily in spending policy. He basically just, he, 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 there was no one, to, to quote actually James Blaine, uh, James Blaine after Garfield's death compiled a, a, a collection of Garfield's speeches and he later wrote of them as being, and these were all legislative speeches, and Blaine described them as being an invaluable compendium on the most important era of American government ever witnessed. So that was, that was how active he was in just the basic mechanics of keeping our system of government functioning, sometimes under extreme duress. Do you want to talk about the election of 1876? Oh, good. Well, all right. Well, there you go. Go ahead. All right. right. Uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Fall, fall 1876, a uh, presidential election happens and something unprecedented breaks. In the aftermath of the election, the losing side of this presidential race declares fraud and threatens civil war in order to forcefully inaugurate who they claim to be the rightful president by force. I wonder why you wrote it. Well, well, I, well, that wasn't why I wrote it, but when I was re reaching that period, I was like, oh man, wow. It's like Mark Twain, it was like Mark Twain said, history rhymes. Um, doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Um, and so, but the, but the background details were that the Democrats at that time had conducted a campaign of violence in what was then a mostly redeemed American South, and they had uh, killed or scared away enough black voters from the polls to switch the South entirely Democratic. In the aftermath of those initial results, Republicans control enough of the election machinery in a few of those Southern states, including my home state of Louisiana, um, to switch enough Democrat, to invalidate enough Democratic ballots to switch a few of those states back Republicans. So the official results are Rutherford Hayes, the Republican, uh, has lost the popular vote, but he's won the Electoral College by one delegate. So as thin a margin as constitutionally possible, the Democrats go crazy. Um, they threaten civil war, and this is unprecedented constitutional territory. The country is suddenly frightened of a second civil war in a little over a decade. And uh, Congress is in this awful spot because there's no precedent for this. There's no, nothing of this kind has ever been seen. The language in, that, that was you know, existing in our frameworks at that time was delightfully vague. You know, and then the vote shall be counted. No one knew what that meant. Um, and so, the, but the key person who brokers behind the scenes deals to try to avert bloodshed, to keep the Democrats calm, to break up the Democratic coalition, and eventually ensure the continued perpetuation of our government is James Garfield. He is the now the senior most House Republican. He goes to Louisiana to investigate violence against Black Americans himself. He gets very heartbroken over one lady story in particular. He interviews her. She had watched her husband allegedly be killed by a Klansman in rural Louisiana. And this woman's name was Eliza. And that was Garfield's mother's name. And that hits very deeply home to him. And suddenly all that distance he had built somewhat deliberately from that cause over his life, his political life gets you know, shortened to a hair's breadth in a moment. And then he goes back to Washington and he's torn up. He's, he's trying to think of some new way to bring justice to the South. And he ends up being this leading broker of a series of deals that eventually results in, and this is historically very controversial and people are still debating what exactly happened. But there's a deal that is struck in the new year, right before the inauguration, where Democrats say that they'll allow the votes to be certified for Hayes if in exchange Hayes withdraws the last federal troops from the South, ending enforcement of civil rights, ending what remained of Reconstruction. And Garfield was invited to all of those conversations and he was there for them. But so inauguration day comes, President Hayes takes a train from Columbus, or sorry, from Spiegel Grove, his home in Ohio, to Washington, D.C. He doesn't even know if he's going to get inaugurated that day. But he turns up in Washington. He's on stage. Garfield is in the background, and he's the only person on stage who's feeling happy. Everybody else is dubious about what's just gone through. But Garfield is just thrilled internally because, again, he's avoided conflict. He's avoided acrimony. He's, hel he's helped steer the nation. There are many people involved, but he played a key role in helping steer the nation away from its second existential conflict in a little over 10 years. And it's just a fascinating perspective on another forgotten chapter of our history. Yeah, absolutely. And so he played a significant role in that uh, presidential election. And it turns out he plays a very significant role in the next presidential yeah, election. Poor guy, poor guy. He got him poor killed. Guy, yeah, and he's not um, really seeking the job. No, it's no, also fairly yeah. common. So you, yeah, you fast forward to 1880. So Rutherford Hayes' administration has gone just about as poorly and even poorer than many people predicted. Um, they said that he went in on a majority of one because of that electoral college vote, and he went out by the consent of all. <laughs> um, he only had one term. He had to deal with his whole administration. Everybody called brother fraud. I'm going to play on his first name. 
Um, but the Republican Party had gotten even more factionalized over his administration. You had in one corner, you had the stalwarts. This is what they called themselves. And the stalwarts viewed themselves as unrepentant Republicans who believed that the abuse of political power was necessary for using it. They were the great, they were also called, believed in using the public bureaucracy to enrich themselves personally and appointing cronies to all these key federal civil service jobs. So like you're, you're, even here in this constituency, the Stowarts believed if they had control over the machinery, the federal machinery, they would make your local tax collector, your local sheriff, uh, your local post office workers, they would make them Stowarts. They would put loyalists in those jobs. That was how the Stowarts operated. And those bureaucrats would be allowed to profit in insane ways, ways that we wouldn't tolerate today to take cuts of their, you know, if you were a court clerk, for example, a Stowart court clerk in Manhattan, you would be allowed to personally pocket some of the court fees that were paid to you over the course of your job. So that was how the Stowarts operated. They believed that was necessary in order to keep our system together. In another corner, you had the half-breeds. The half-breeds were the main rivals of the Stowarts, and they were called the half-breeds because Stowarts did not see them as real Republicans. So again, history rhymes, I think. Um, <laughs> but the half-breeds were led by James Blaine, who was just, as I describe him in the book, he was, I think, the first American politician to run on charisma and nothing else. He was just, they called him the magnetic man because of just how overwhelmingly charming he was. And he was from Maine. So James Blaine from Maine, you can see how the songs write themselves. Um, and, uh, but he was also repulsive for the same reason to many Republicans. And he also was pretty corrupt. He was also, a very, he, he believed in patronage, corruption, spoils, independent civil service reformists who just wanted to reform the bureaucracy, clean government, get rid of these corrupt structures. Hayes was one of those. Hayes had alienated everybody. Republicans going into 1880, the next presidential election, they can read the tea leaves. They see that none of these factions, whichever of these factions candidates wins in the convention contest of that year is going to lose in the fall. So they all start thinking, who is the one man who is so just militantly friendly and kind and who everybody has nice things to say about? Who's, you know, who's the one person who could deliver the presidency for us? And they think James Garfield, the minority leader of the House. So they go to him and he's terrified by the idea. He sees nothing useful in the presidency. He's seen four administrations by that time, which is, again, a crazy long record. He'd seen four administrations end poorly for the people in charge of them for a variety of reasons, from Lincoln to Hayes. That's a pretty you know, disappointing group of presidents, how they ended. And um, he writes the, of the presidency not being a productive office. He wants to be productive. He wants to be a useful statesman. And so he's shooing away all these callers. But he's saying, you know, I would be greatly discouraged if I thought that my nomination was at all likely. There is too much possible work in me to set so near an end to it all. So he's trying not to. But here's the secret. Um, there's no such person in Washington who is not interested in the president. Garfield goes to the convention and he manages himself in just such a way that throughout this week long contest, he say the right thing at the right time at the right place to convince enough Republicans that he is the unity candidate. And he does something key that we might talk about during the question and answer session. Um, but he ends up sealing his fate because when he comes out of that contest as the unexpected winner, uh, he's sown the seeds for his own doom in many ways. And uh, it, it goes to show, and what lies ahead of that is, it shows he was perfectly right to be afraid of what lay ahead in many ways. But you know, now I think we can tease that out with questions from the audience, probably. <laughs> yeah, so I think so. If we want to, uh, uh, he becomes president. He's there for four months. He's there. He's there for six months. But he's he, he's three months in. He gets shot in the back in downtown D.C. And then he takes three months to die. And uh, the scenes of that are off. Where's my water? Oh, there it is. Um, the scenes of that are awful and novel and fascinating. Um, and whenever, whenever anybody's written about him, that's what they focused on. But this was much more about the remarkable life that preceded all of that. Great. Well, we, we did get the five-minute warning, so uh, maybe we'll turn it open to uh, questions from all of you, and you can elaborate on that, that yeah, last part of absolutely. his life as well. If you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. And I see one over there right away. Give me one sec. I'll come with the mic. Um, it's not really a question, it's an observation. In the uh, Wall Street Journal, there was a book review um, of your work. And one of the things that was brought out that I thought sets the scene a little bit is that, the, you know, in today's world, the executive branch is viewed as very powerful. 
but in those days, the customs house in New York accounted mm. for two thirds of the revenue of the federal government. And so the guy who controlled that, Roscoe Conklin, um, had a lot of power against, um, you know, and that I think is teasing into how he sowed the scenes because he made an ad for Roscoe Conklin. Yeah, so that's a very good question um, or a very good observation. I have to say the power rested in the Senate bosses, the Senate really. Was the, was the key, was the center of a lot of American governmental power. And the reason for that was, as you described, so that system of uh, distribution of federal jobs, the, our, our bureaucratic positions, that was left up to individual senators and congressmen to allocate in their own districts. There was no, or there was very little formal pipeline for civil servants in America. So you had in New York, for example, um, Roscoe Conkling, senator from New York, leader of the Stalwarts, by virtue of his jurisdiction, he controlled appointments to the, or at least for much of his career, he controlled appointments to the New York's Customs House. And the person he put in charge of the New York's Customs House, Chester Arthur, <laughs> Chester Arthur. And uh, Chester Arthur was one of the wealthiest men of his uh, area of that time, because as customs collector of the Port of Manhattan, uh, he was allowed, again, per the bureaucratic norms of that day for a public servant, he could take a personal cut of any fees or taxes imposed on imports into America that went through that customs house. So Garfield, but, but Garfield had learned the lessons of the Hayes administration. Hayes had alienated the Stalwarts and the Senate bosses. So Garfield knows, and this is very much, this is why he got nominated. This is why he's still around on the national stage. This is why he's still powerful. He knows the importance of striking a deal and being pragmatic. And so he tries to ally with Conkling and he makes his, so after winning the nomination unexpectedly, he strikes a series of deals with the Stowarts, including Conkling. And one of the ways he tried to do that, he made his vice president, Chester Arthur. That was his way of trying to get Costco's, uh, Conkling's uh, uh, loyalty. And, um, but it all falls apart during his administration because the jobs that the Stowarts want, they don't get all of them during the Garfield administration. And it kicks off this ugly civil war that as Garfield puts it during his administration, during this fight, he says, this battle between me and the Stowards, this will settle if the president is the executive of the nation or the registering clerk of the Senate. And he wins that battle. And so he sets that precedent. But in the aftermath of that battle, a mentally ill person who identifies as a Stalwart decides that if he uh, shoots Garfield and kills Garfield, the new president, Stalwart Chester Arthur, will be so grateful he'll give the shooter any job in the federal government the shooter wants. And then so he find, he stalks Garfield to a station in downtown DC, the Baltimore Potomac, which doesn't stand anymore. It's now the National Gallery of Art, sadly. And um, the shooter shoots, and then he says to the policeman who's arresting him, I am a stalwart, and now Chester Arthur will be president. So that's where, not the drama begins, but that's where difficult difficulty begins for a lot of people, not only Garfield, but also Chester Arthur, who had nothing to do with any of this. Really, uh, so, but, but it was fascinating. Yeah, different norms at that time. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. C can an argument be made that Arthur is somewhat of a, a surprisingly good president, maybe accidentally so, from some of the things he did? This is not the topic of your book, but what are your thoughts on that? Oh, no, I think you're totally right. And I think that's, that's actually the record on him in many ways, at least when it comes to um, cleaning up government. He had everybody expect he, he, he had never been elected to anything before the vice presidency. He was famous as this. He was famous as this crony. He was somebody who was seen as one of the he, he was one of the most famously corrupt men in America by that point. Hayes, Rutherford Hayes had almost ruined his administration trying to kick Chester Arthur out of the Customs House of New York. Um, but when Garfield got, gets shot, um, Arthur has essentially a nervous breakdown. He, he is fundamentally a good person. As I write in the book, he has a yearning for camaraderie, a love for the high life, but a moral spine that's just flexible enough to yield to both. He just loves being one of the boys. He, he, and he got, he got carried along with the stalwart machines, and he just wanted a nice life. A lot of things happened to him ahead of the vice presidency. His wife dies. That breaks him. Garfield is shot, and, Arthur, and not only is Garfield shot and the Stowarts are blamed, the, the, the assassin had credited Arthur on the scene with the shooting. Imagine, imagine today if something like that happened. Um, and Arthur is reading every single paper in the country, pretty much, and everybody is saying, um, 
we're, we're about to have one of the worst scoundrels and one of the least accomplished executive people in American history in control of our nation. The Stowers are going to run everything. This is in many ways the end of clean government in America. But uh, Arthur reacts very differently. He's one of the few men, I think, who actually improve, who become better people once they become president. And he's in hiding in New York. He's hiding and he's, he's crying. He's in his basement on Lexington Avenue. And he's trying to avoid the press who are just, as Garfield's dying, you know, more attention is being put on Arthur. And this woman writes him because regular people back then could write, you know, our candidates and have a good chance of getting a response. This woman named Julia Sand writes to Arthur and she writes, uh, you know, the people are weeping. The nation is mourning. Do you know why? It's not because of Garfield dying. It's because you're going to be the president, <laughs> and so, which is an awful way to start. But then she goes on and she says, but I believe you have good in you fundamentally. She says, you can use this as a turning point in your life. Reform. Be, you know, rise to the occasion, defy the expectations of the nation. And that's exactly what he does. He gets into power. He devotes much of his administration to signing legislation that does away with this, the machine power structures. He starts to uh, regulate the way federal jobs are awarded in the government. Um, he passes, he signs, I should say, the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883, which starts to award government jobs based on something called merit it, it, rather than political connections. It, it, it exempts uh, it frees our bureaucrats from being forced to donate to political campaigns in exchange for their jobs. It starts to professionalize the American government and take politics out of the basic day-to-day -day business of just interacting with our administrative services. And we've reaped untold benefits from that. And they said about Arthur, by the way, I don't want to go on too long. I could talk for a while about him. You asked a perfect question. But they said when he left office and he filled out the rest of Garfield's term, they said that no man ever entered the White House more generally distrusted and none ever left more widely respected than Chester Arthur. And the Stowarts and the machinists and the corrupt bosses of that time lambasted Arthur as a great traitor, and they would never really recover. Corruption, public corruption would never quite reach the same scale in America. Yeah, question rewinding to the Civil War. Um, Garfield was a main engineer behind the Tullahoma campaign, and he was, you know, greatly in support of Rosecrans. And I wanted to know what you found out in terms of having a non-military trained colonel. <laughs> How was he able to really contend with a lot of guys that came out of military school? Yeah, a little bit. of Well, so, OK, a little bit of background. The Tullahoma campaign was a military campaign that led up to the Battle of Chickamauga which is one of the bloodiest conflicts of the Civil War. And uh, so Garfield being a volunteer general, volunteer officer, he had to compete once he got higher up in the ranks with people who had actually been professional soldiers who had gone to West Point. Garfield called these the West Point class. And he didn't like them. He said when the war was going poorly, he wrote to one of his friends, if the Union dies from this conflict, let it be written on the tombstone, die to West Point. That was what he felt about professional soldiers, because also not unright, not unjustly, he thought that professional that professional officer class had a lot of sympathies with the South and were unwilling to strike body blows against slave South. Anyway, he did end up being an architect of the Tullahoma campaign. He was taken under the wing of General William Rosecrans, who was uh, one of the leading generals of the Union Army of that time. And um, Garfield became his aide, his uh, chief of staff and was really needling Rosecrans to get moving on this campaign. Um, and he did an effective job in advising Rosecrans, but he also played politics. Garfield actually ended up stabbing Rosecrans in the back, very dramatically so, because Rosecrans took a while to get his horses moving, his horses, metaphorically speaking, out of Murfreesboro to launch the Tullahoma campaign, which led to the Battle of Chickamauga. Garfield got tired of, and, and a lot of people got tired of Rosecrans dragging his heels. Lincoln was starting to describe Rosecrans as like one of the great laggards of the Union Army, the one person who's not actually going out there and taking the fight to the rebels. Garfield is agitating for a fight. He thought Rosecrans would be this aggressive general. He's disappointed by Rosecrans' refusal to take the initiative. So Garfield writes a letter to Treasury Secretary Salmon Chase, who was a mentor of Garfield's. And he basically writes behind Rosecrans' back, this hesitation is not of my own doing. I'm, 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 I'm urging Rosecrans to take the initiative to fight the rebels. And uh, anyway, the Tullahoma campaign goes well, but it, it, it results in the Battle of Chickamauga, which was a great calamity for the Union. The Union didn't technically lose it, but it was an awful conflict. And in the aftermath, there's this great debate in the Lincoln cabinet about what to do about Rosecrans. And then because Chase had a 
flair for the dramatic. He says at the, at, at the you know, in, in the closing moments of this debate about what to do about Rosecrans, uh, Chase produces a letter that said, and he reads it aloud. And then, he's, and then he says at the very end, and this letter criticizing Rosecrans fiercely was written by Rosecrans' best friend, James Garfield. <laughs> and so, so he played politics and that was a secret. That was a secret for a very long time. It came out at a, in, during about Garfield's presidential campaign. But it, so he was, a, he was an effective soldier in many ways. His intellect was remarkable. But um, again, he was also a politician in a soldier's uniform in many ways. And he wasn't afraid to pull strings when he needed to. And that's actually the, that's exactly what you don't want to see in our modern military. You know, general right over their senior officer's head, getting that person fired. Insane. Yep. This will be a difficult question, and I apologize for you might have to do a little bit of speculation, but what direction or achievements or things do you think had Garfield been able to serve a full term or maybe two? Mm. What direction do you think he would have taken the country in? Do you think he would have made an effective president? And when you came to write the book, when you first started, were you positive, negative, or neutral about him? Mm. And when you ended, what was your in Garfield or not? Yeah, I so it's it's a very good question. And a lot of people are curious about what he would have been if he'd been a full executive. And you can't help but view it through the lens of his assassination somewhat. The reaction to his death was not unlike, I'd say, the Kennedy assassination. People built him into something he was not in many ways politically. And he became this martyr, this this fallen young American president who was killed, you know, who was struck down in office, who seemed so inspiring and who had led such a full and vigorous life. Um, and a lot of people would see that image. They'd also look at his inaugural address. His inaugural address reads as this wonderfully muscular, progressive piece of oratory. He endorses, you know, a return to civil rights enforcement in the South. He says that suppression of the black vote violently is should be treated as they would treason against the king in the old country back in the UK. Uh, so that's that's the scale of crime that he's describing, disenfranchising black Americans. He's equating it to treason, basically. He also endorses the idea of universal public education in America as a cure to the, the, the nation's social problems. He also endorses the idea of building a canal to connect Atlantic and Pacific across Central America. Would you so Talk about prophetic. Yeah, it was, it was like he was looking a few chapters ahead. He wasn't the first person to endorse that idea, but nuts. Um, but the truth is, by that point, he had been elected because he was an incrementalist and he was a pragmatist. And he was somebody who didn't swing for the fences. He believed at that point in his career that politics was the art of the possible in America. And uh, he, he was torn up about this in many ways. One thing he wrote, because he'd been such a firebrand its crusader to Congress when he'd been fighting the Civil War. That's what he staked a lot of his, you know, leadership in, on the battlefield on. Um, but you fast forward to when he's president-elect and he's writing that only time can be the healer of America's racial wounds with wisdom and justice at work, as he puts it. And uh, he uses his executive power in creative ways. He gives a lot of jobs, federal jobs to black Americans, including Frederick Douglass and Bruce Blanche. Uh, he even wants to appoint the first uh, black Americans to be ambassadors to Europe. He wants to create a core of American black diplomats to the white countries. Um, but he's also, you know, he, he, he's just not that great reformist that a lot of people like to imagine he could have been. I thought he would have been an incrementalist. Again, as for whether I, whether I like him, um, that's the hardest question to ask a biographer is whether you like your subject. <laughs> uh, I think he's a very good look. His whole, his whole life is one, a very good reminder that a lot of the things we call unprecedented today in terms of our the debates we're having in American society about the soul of our nation, um, the events that we're going through in many ways, they're actually not all that unprecedented. These things have, in ways, both reassuring and not happened before in some shape or form. And then second, he's a very good look at what it is like when you have somebody who is a pathologically reasonable person in power in Washington. Uh, he, he doesn't want to offend anybody. He wants to be everybody's friend. He, is, he just finds himself on his flexibility on the issues. And he is loath to offend anybody even for an instant. And the result is you get a very morally, because what, what happens when somebody's just focused on being nice and polite and easygoing and you know just trying to get things done in DC, you get somebody who's party to a lot of uh, gray areas, really. He, he was not somebody, for example, who wanted to antagonize the bosses of his time. He wanted to work with them, and he used patronage his own way to reward his own loyalists. 
um, you know, he believed that outrages in the South, you know, couldn't be tolerated, but he didn't believe the federal government should do anything to stop them, really. Um, and uh, on racial issues, even at some points, he was very complicated. So uh, he's a wonderful encapsulation of a complex time, and I think a very complex nation. And that's what made him so fun to write. Uh, my background is uh, in medical, so I'd like your views on oh, yeah, great. his Fantastic. treatment. Fantastic. All right. It's been very well written about. There's been a lot of studies on this. But the, the fundamental problem, so Garfield didn't die of the gunshot. He died of the infection that was induced. And the core of the problem, in many ways, was that American doctors of that time had their hat, had one old medicine, traditional medicine, and another in modern techniques, something that had just fairly recently arrived from Europe was the was germ theory. The idea that infections in the body are not caused by imbalances of fluids and humors in, in the body, but rather external invaders. And I have the, the and that was, that was that was put forward very aggressively by a British surgeon named Joseph Lister. Uh, and there's this quote from an American doctor at the time that uh, goes, if we were to believe Mr. Lister's ideas, so they don't even call him doctor, they go, um, we must believe fundamentally that the world around us is covered in invisible organisms. And as a modern reader, you're like, yes, that's exactly what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but they didn't quite get that. So lying on the, uh, the train depot floor, doctors are arriving on the scene and they're pushing unwashed hands, fingers into his bullet wound. They're trying to find the track of the bullet. They think that's going to be critical. To, and they're not wrong, but they're trying to find out, you know, how badly wounded he is. And then they're sending probes in on the floor of the station. And these are getting hooked on bone shards at a depth of three and a half inches. And they have to like yank them out of his back. They're basically seeding, like almost in an agricultural way, just pathogens throughout his body. And, um, by the way, and he's put on a dirty horsehair mattress. So you, it, uh, as you know, it's impossible to find where exactly an infection came from, but you can't look at that and not think that the, the fault lay with these practitioners. Also, by the way, it's one of the people who was shooting Secretary of War, Robert Todd Lincoln. He had made Abraham Lincoln's last surviving son Secretary of War in great part because he wanted again to patch the, patch the old Republican party back together. So, uh, so Robert Todd Lincoln witnessed all of this and he was torn up about it. Anyway, Garfield gets moved to the White House and um, hooked on like the medical reports that are coming out over these weeks and months from the doctor's office, the doctors who are attending Garfield in the White House. And they're sending out bulletins that are describing healthy pus. Because pus is seen as one of these fluids that's a sign in traditional medicine at that time, good healing. That's, that's what the humor is associated with. So they're describing in very graphic detail the, the, the volume, the consistency, the color of all these things pouring out of the president. And then they're also reporting this bullet hole is now a cavity. It's now 12 inches deep in his body. He's hollowing out and he, he pus is leaking into his ear canal. His parotid gland is just swelling. And he, he, it, it's, it was an awful public, which is, again, fascinated with these giant billboards are being put up in American cities reporting all of this. Um, the, the public is realizing that the doctors are full of BS gradually because he's get, clearly getting worse. The doctors are insisting all this pus, all this stuff coming out of the president, all of his symptoms, sign of he, he, he's on the mend. But the, the public is realizing it and they're writing in with ideas. This is unrelated to your question, but they're writing in with ideas on how to fix him, how to make him comfortable. Naval engineers put together the first air conditioner in human history to cool his room and they do so successfully, but it, it gets turned off because it's too loud. Um, they're, tr they're also, they think, they still think the bullet, the bullet location is a big problem. We know now today that's less of the problem. It was more of the infection. But um, so people are writing with ideas on how to find the bullet or get it out of Garfield. So people are writing in regular, like you and me, they're writing in, they're saying, hang him upside down by his ankles. The, 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 the lead will fall out. Um, somebody writes in with the idea of like putting a, a, an inventor creates an incomplete probe or an incomplete circuit that's connected to a probe where the probe, if it touches metal, lights up the circuit. So they're saying, put that in him. And whenever, you know, the wand will hit it. And then that's what you know where the bullet is. But Alexander Graham Bell, of all people, who had already invented the telephone, he's working in DC at that time. He's fascinated just from an intellectual perspective, the idea of finding a bullet in, the, in, in an organic tissue. He creates the first metal detector to find the bullet in Garfield's body. And he uses it, but the results are bad. He, the, it works in practice, but when he's actually in the sick room 
the, the, the instrument has bad results and um, the, uh, the, the results he gets are inconclusive and he's very embarrassed. He, he, he kind of hedges his way out of it. He realizes at, once he's outside that there are metal springs in the mattress. That's what was throwing off the, the device. Not that that would have changed anything, by the way, because he was, you know, the bull location, nothing to do with the infection by that point. But it was this long, awfully drawn out process. And a lot of doctors have returned to that case history and what happened and how. And they see it as this transition point in American history. Ar Arthur is, is, has locked himself in his house on Lexington Avenue. <laughs> No, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, we, uh, the, 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 the American government at that time really doesn't need a lot of, a lot of active management by the president. I think you could argue today it really doesn't. Um, but all of the technically Garfield signs one piece of like one piece of, you know, executive business. He signs an extradition order from his sickbed, but that's the only piece of business he can do. And that was done in order to convince the country that there is still a hand on the wheel. But in practice, uh, government of the country had devolved to the cabinet. All the cabinet secretaries, Robert Todd Lincoln later wrote, everybody's just doing their jobs, just waiting for their presidents to get better. Not really that terribly much business to do. Um, and so I described in the book, it's like a speeding bicycle removed of its rider. It can go on for a little bit by itself by that point. Um, but there were questions at the time. There was somebody who a lot of columnists, Democratic columnists were writing. So is the control of the government now in a bunch of the hands of a bunch of unelected officials? Who's really pulling the strings here? And so that was fun to see. We have time for two more questions. All right. Um, in the theme of history rhymes, is there anybody within the last 20 years in American politics that reminds you of him or his potential? Um, the worst, so the worst questions I get asked are ones for like, describe somebody today. <laughs> it's like, because because you never want to one you never want to compare somebody who's assassinated to a modern day subject too. Um, uh, but you know you don't want, I, I want to escape politics today in many ways. Um, some but reviewers include well you know what's interesting about that Wall Street Journal review. Uh, the Wall Street Journal review is written by somebody who had, I didn't know him but he yes yeah, Smith who had written a great book of Gerald about Gerald Ford. Um, other reviewers said that Garfield reminded them of Gerald Ford because it was a House Republican who had been, who, who was from the Midwest, who was famously easy to get along with, who was a legislative pragmatist and who had been put in the White House initially as vice president for Ford because uh, they were seen as a trustworthy, agreeable figure because you know Ford was put in, in the vice presidency because Spiro Agnew did what Spiro Agnew did. And then, and then, and then he became president because Nixon did what Nixon did. And so he, but, but that was an interesting comparison a lot of people make. And interesting, has said that um, Hayes reminds them, Hayes, who came before uh, Garfield, reminded them of Jimmy Carter because he was this outside Washington, Washington outsider governor who was elected to like clean house and who came up against great problems while doing so. Um, so because Garfield is kind of pushed into the side of, in the footnotes of history, you know, a lot of times in history class, you just kind of go through like, oh, and then there's these presidents that, you know, nothing really big happens, mm. um, which is unfortunate given Garfield's story. What do you recommend that educators kind of tying Garfield and the whole Department of Education part and him being a teacher? Um, mm. What do you think that teachers should know about, even if they have five, 10, or even a small lesson about Garfield? What do you think they should focus on? What are some key things that you think they could possibly talk about to at least try to illuminate a little bit of this man's life, even though, you know, he was struck down so quickly and he unfortunately is always a footnote. Yeah, no, he is. Um, I find listing his accomplishments, everything he did as a wonderful way of just describing to people how important of a person he was and how impressive a person he was. So like, log cabin to White House. And by the way, when he moved into his White House, he took his mom with him, that, so, which was even more impressive, I think, in many ways. Uh, so, but, you know, with all the almost precedent-shattering things he did from, you know, young, youngest brigadier general at that time in the Union Army, second youngest congressman. And um, there's actually a few pieces of oratory that I would recommend for you. One is something that he wrote. Well, this is actually a piece of writing he did. He did an article for The Atlantic called A Century of Congress. 
and the Atlantic had asked him to write this because you know he was the supreme legislator by that time, and you know it was the centenary, centennial of the nation. They wanted somebody to write a history of Congress and how that had changed over a century of American history, and it's just a great document. And he writes about um, and he writes about how you know you need committee work now. You used to have these lone wolf legislators. Now you just need some. You know you can't now. No one can read all the bills like because there's just so much paperwork building up in Congress. And he also writes about the invention of the telegraph. This is very compelling to me. He writes about um, how to quote him. Um, the Telegraph will bring to millions of American breakfast tables tomorrow what is done on the floors of Congress today. And he describes how revolutionary that technology is. And he writes about not being sure if that technology is going to be good for our politicians to work. Because he's like, what happens when you put congressmen in DC in the spotlight all the time? You change their behavior. <laughs> and, and so that's quite prophetic, I think. He also, there's this 4th of July oration he gave. I, so something I think about kids these days, I say that like I'm not one, um, is there are a lot of people who are hyper progressive these days who see no connective tissue between themselves and earlier parts of our nation's history. If you read Garfield's July 4th, 1865 speech at the end of the Civil War, um, Lincoln had died, the war had been won. Garfield goes back to his home constituent. He doesn't use his July 4th speech to praise what had happened in the nation. He instead gives this fiery religious sermon where he, he describes the holy contract that the union had signed with black citizens and how it is now honor bound to provide them freedom. And then he goes on to write, what is freedom? Is it the bare privilege of not being chained, whipped, and scourged? No, it's full citizenship. It's full access to all the rights of white Americans. And if we don't deliver this, the world, you know, it will be our downfall. And then he faints at the top of the speech. <laughs> so he, and that's a transition point for the house. But if you look at his early oratory, I might be able to bit provide you a written list. That was a very good question. It's just, it's, it's very enlightening. It's very compelling and it's very tragic and it's very timely. And it's just, it's just a new vision on a type of American that I didn't really appreciate existed at that time. And it seems more relevant than ever in many ways. Yeah. So thank you. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap up, um, but can we give a round of applause for Jeff and Charlotte? Thank you. Um, one more thank you and shout out to the National Civil War Museum and Jeff for, for joining us this evening. Thank you again. Um,